What's up Versus Babies? I've got another video today all about the design of Versus System 2 PCG. Today we're going to talk about what it takes to design a 200 card set for the game, also commonly known as a battles box. And I just want to get out of the way right now that I do not work for Upper Deck, I don't work for Super Awesome Games, I don't do anything but play Versus System and uh, design some cards in my free time. So just want to make sure that that's pretty clear right away that I don't have any official insider information into what goes into doing this, but I wanted to do something for one of my favorite shows and I wanted to break it down into the constraints of a 200 card battles box. And uh, in doing so, I learned a lot about what goes into the creation of one of these sets. And while creating this, I also looked at a lot of other fan-created cards, and a lot of them were really fun, and I just kind of got this feeling that I wanted to do something really good. Like, I wanted the card set to be good. Not just, like, a fun fan set that's kind of cute, that makes you think about things, but I wanted it to actually be playable within the Versus System ecosystem as it is today. And let me tell you, that is not an easy thing to do, because in order to make something good, like what do I mean by making it good? Basically, I mean making the cards balanced, making them unique, and making them flavorful. And I think those are the three key ingredients that go into making a really good versus system set. Now, for me, the stakes are very low because I'm not making any money off this. I'm not selling it. I'm not even giving it away. This is all just purely fantasy. So. For me, it means a lot less, but I still wanted to kind of give myself the constraints of a battles box just so I could see a little bit of, again, what it takes to actually bring a set like this to reality. The show that I wanted to base my set off is Peaky Blinders, which is a show on Netflix and BBC. It's about 1920s-ish gangsters in Birmingham, England. It stars Killian Murphy and Sam Neill and uh, Adrian Brody's in it, Tom Hardy, so it's got this really all-star cast and it's this really fun gritty TV show and I thought it would be fun to pit them against the superheroes of the MCU and X-Files um, members and, and things like that. So that's the show that I'm working with with these cards. So without further ado, let's dig into the actual design aspect of this. So let's start with balance. One of the things you start working with balance right away are the different card types. So you've got characters, you've got main characters and supporting characters, you've got plot twists, locations, basic locations, special locations, equipment, all of those things. You already have to start thinking about how many of each of those you want in a box. And I base this off of what I already see coming out in boxes. So when you have these 200 card battles boxes, there are typically four main characters per team in each box, if there's usually two teams. So in this case, there are two teams. So I've got my four main characters on each side, that's starting out. We also have each battles box comes with the locations. So there's eight of each color or each power symbol of lo basic location. So 32 of your cards are gonna be dedicated to those basic locations. And then usually you have one special location each, uh, commonly known as the wild cards, and so you'll have eight cards, eight slots dedicated to those cards as well. So I started to keep track of all this with this giant spreadsheet so I can see who the characters are and how many of them I have and what their cost is and all that kind of stuff. So this spreadsheet is going to be pretty much the key to keeping myself sane as this set develops because it keeps track of more than just card types, it keeps track of all kinds of things which I'll get into as this video goes on. One other thing that you want to consider when you're balancing out your set is keyword powers versus superpowers. So you want to have a good balance of those two things. You don't want to have your entire box turn out to have all keyword powers because then it makes the game a little bit less fun because you don't have as many choices to make about using superpowers. And likewise, you don't want it to be all superpowers because then it's going to be really expensive to play any number of those cards beyond just a few because you're in order to take advantage of their powers you constantly have to be flipping locations face down. I tried to break that down into about two superpower symbols per team for the supporting characters 
and then um, sort of any number of keywords that felt right beyond that. So some characters have keywords and superpowers, some just have keywords, and some have uh, just superpowers. And then if you dig further into superpowers, there's of course four different power symbols that you have to balance out as well. Uh, in some cases you could use the other two superpowers, which are humanity and alien, but there aren't any cosmic characters or powers in Peaky Blinders, so those I just cut them out altogether. I decided I wasn't going to use them at all. So I was left with the four main superpower sets, energy, intellect, might, and skill, and that helped me to kind of get the balance of not just superpowers, but also the keyword powers, because I decided I didn't want more than two of any power symbol for the main characters. So, for example, if I have four main characters and they have two levels, then I wanted to use each power symbol twice amongst those eight cards. So two of them would have energy, two of them would have skill, etc. And so that helped to kind of guide the direction of the cards that I wanted to create for main characters. And then for the supporting characters, I also wanted two power symbols per team for each of those power symbols. So basically I was gonna get, in an ideal world, eight different superpowers in, for main characters and eight different superpowers for supporting characters and then keyword powers would fill out all the rest. That didn't happen necessarily in reality, but being able to keep track of that once again on the spreadsheet, it was a, I was able to see pretty visually where those different superpowers were going and I was able to get a pretty good balance even if it wasn't perfect in the end. Another thing you want to think about is do the cards fit well in the existing format? So in this case, we're mainly talking about photographic format. The, the two overarching formats in the game are illustrated in photographic. You can't mix them together. And so since this is a photographic format, since I'm taking screenshots from a TV show, I wanted to make sure that it fit well and was balanced with the existing photographic cards. So those are a little bit more overpowered than the illustrated cards because there's a smaller card pool to choose from. And so I wanted to make sure that um, if I it came down to is this card too overpowered or, or underpowered or whatever, I wanted to push it a little bit more um, just because the photographic format is a little bit tougher and a little bit stronger to play with. Another tricky thing that was a little bit hard to deal with with this card set is the balance of gender and race. So the more social aspects of the game. So if, if someone who is a person of color is playing this game, do they feel like they are well represented in the game? Or if a woman wants to play the game, does she feel like the women are strong character, just as strong of characters as men? And um, I'm unfortunately limited by the source material of the show, which is pretty white. So I did what I could to kind of squeeze out the some of the more interesting characters that were underused on the show, but that does provide more of a challenge, and if it's not balanced, uh, I did what I could. I'll, I'll say that much. I, at least I think I did what I could. And then the last thing that I want to talk about when it comes to balance is the fact that the Peaky Blinders don't fly at all. Uh, it's 1920. I don't know when the first airplane was invented, but basically people are taking boats if they want to get to America. They're not flying around, at least uh, not yet in the show. And so they don't have jetpacks, it's not steampunk, so it's like how do you get flight into the game? I did this in a few different ways, well a couple different ways, and one was a plot twist called High Ground, and basically that says it, it kind of stations one of your people up high and it gives them flight and range and they keep those powers as long as they don't move or get stunned and so it gives you a way to even if you can't fly with those necessarily you can you can um, get one shot off with flight but even if you don't want to do that or don't need to do that you can have a flight wall that at pretty much at any time anytime you play that plot twist you can put it on anyone and, and they can become a flight blocker which I think is kind of a fun fun thing to think about and they also get ranged so they kind of become a little bit more deadly but they can't they're they're limited in what they can do they can make one attack that way uh, they have to be in the front row they can't move or they'll lose their position so it's sort of like they're coming down from the high ground so 
Um, I thought that was kind of fun, because then if a character is flying, then it's sort of like there's someone up high that's blocking them from flying over and, and hitting your back row. So that one was fun. And then there's another uh, plot twist, a one-of-a-kind plot twist that grants you flight, and that's called Barney Thomason, and it's based on one of the characters in the show. And he is not only uh, stationed high up, similar to high ground, he, he's, he's a sniper that takes a, takes a very high ground, um, but he's also a little bit, uh, he's got his head in the clouds. And so I thought that him being able to give you flight spoke to Barney's character on a couple different levels, which I thought was kind of fun. The next thing I want to talk about for making your custom card set good is uniqueness. And there are a lot of different things you want to think about when you're making your cards unique. So when we look at main characters, I kind of wanted each one to have its own play style. I think when you look at card sets from a purely competitive point of view, then there's a tendency for you to want to make everything kind of super pushed and super aggressive and just like give them powers that will kind of automatically win you the game in, e in less than ideal circumstances. And I just don't think that makes for fun cards and I don't think it makes for um, a good game that's worth talking about. So I wanted each character to have its pl own play style and uh, sort of make them a puzzle that you have to figure out. So a character like Abarama Gold or Grace Burgess, those characters, when as they progress through the game and as they level up, then they kind of tell a story that follows along with the show. A couple cards like Polly Gray and Luca Cengretta encourage starting at a disadvantage early in the game, and then you can reap the benefits in the late game with their um, superpowers, which was, which was kind of fun. And then there's Tommy Shelby, who's the main character of the TV show and he has a pretty challenging level up power, but he's also balanced out by being able to potentially KO main characters by paying a couple locations in the late game. And so the way he's structured kind of disincentivizes your opponent from attacking him because he can basically strike so hard in the late game so easily. So all of these different things like kind of make, I was trying to think about ways I can make characters level up into unique play experiences and, and have their power sets do something unique that you haven't seen in the game before. Another thing that I wanted to do is to make sure that attack, defense, and health sets never align for any given cost. It would be easy to have each one cost character have two attack, two defense, and one health, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make each one unique by making the coppers have two attack and one defense and two health, and making the gangsters have one attack and two defense and one health and range. And so I wanted to make it so that you have a lot of choice in when you're building your deck. Do you want someone with a high attack at one cost and a low defense, or do you want someone with a high attack and a high defense, but maybe not the most useful power in, in any, at any given time? Uh, it was really interesting to think about how to balance, like, if you have, say, four four-cost characters, then not just making them four attack, four defense, and one health, and giving them some powers, but to make one six attack and two defense, and, and that kind of stuff. So that was something that I wanted to make sure was completely, each card was completely unique in that way, at any cost on, on any team, pretty much. And I did that with the help of, once again, my trusty spreadsheet. You can just like look down the attack and defense columns and see, you know, what each combination looks like and, and kind of balance things out from there. And maybe you, I'll find something where I've got two three cost characters at three three, and it's like, well, if I, push one of these powers a little bit more than I can take away from their defense to, to balance it out and things like that. So the spreadsheet definitely helped once again aligning those numbers up. I also wanted some unique mechanics to open up new ways to play the game. So someone like Ada Shelby, she can rearrange counters in, in a way that we haven't seen in Versus System yet. Jesse Eden has the ability to call all of your characters out on strikes so they don't do work and costs you more money, more resources if you want to keep them out. So things like that, uh, just having something that like you don't see in the existing game, like not just unique powers, but also making the characters feel like they belong in the game in their own right. So like 
one example that uh, I think I've seen in the past is like if you're a DC fan and you want to make a Flash character, then you could just look at Quicksilver and you could say, oh, Quicksilver has mobile and he has stealth and Quicksilver runs real fast and so like why not just put mobile and stealth on the Flash and be done with it. That's valid, especially if you want to just kind of transpose characters and put like a proxy Flash inside a, a Quicksilver sleeve and be able to build the same decks you know, legally, but just with DC art or whatever. But that's not something that I wanted to do with this show. I really wanted uh, each character to feel like it wasn't just copying a character that already exists in the Versus System universe, especially the photographic universe. And I think you see that with Super Awesome Games, because there's a lot of Quicksilver cards out there, and each one kind of handles his speed in a different way, either by giving him Swarm for multiple attacks, or um, doing the, the mobile and stealth thing. Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot of different th things to think about, and so why limit yourself to like what actually exists in the game um, if you're making this fake fantasy set anyway. Another thing to think about when you wanna make a set unique is how the cards play together. And one of my favorite sets is Shield versus Hydra because I really like the way that the agent and soldier keywords work. And I feel like though that set was kind of a mature point for Versus System because it's like you get this box of cards and you kind of understand how they interplay with each other and how the one kind of builds off of the other. And so I wanted to do something similar. I didn't want to limit myself too much, but I wanted to at least have some kind of flavorful idea that uh, was different in this game, in this set, than compared to the other sets. And so for the Peaky Blinders team, I came up with some powerful one-of-a-kind plot twists, and so there, it's sort of a, intended to be an auto-include if you're playing with the Peaky Blinders main character to get these four plot twists that um, are kind of do a little bit more than you might expect. And then with the uh, trouble team, the evil team in the set, I kind of started coming to this realization that they could cut the legs out from under you because the team deals with a lot of gangsters and, and unsavory types and so there are several ways of basically reducing your opponent's defense if you make big team attacks. And so that's something that comes up through several of the different cards and um, it's been fun to see that um, play out in playtesting. And likewise I also wanted some new mechanics to throw in there and sort of be like uh, promotional items or whatever to like get people excited about the set and so it com came up with these underground plot twists which are three of the four one-of-a-kind plot twists that I put in the, on the Peaky Blinders team are also underground plot twists and what that means is that you can play them face down in your resource row and then when you want to use them you just turn them face up and so it's sort of like a reverse location superpower or something like that. There's a Predator card that does that as well, but I kind of wanted to like formalize it and say like this is something that that you can now theoretically make future plot twists off of and when people see that underground symbol they'll know how to play it. And that's based on um, Tommy Shelby being a tunneler in World War One, and um, each of the people in those underground plot twists are people that he w worked with when he fought in the war. And I think that that was kind of fun because you're putting them in your resource row upside down so it's sort of like they're underground in a tunnel and then you flip them face up and then they ambush you which is sort of signifies him coming and getting his friends back to help him out um, which is what happens during the show. So, um, But that's getting into the flavor aspect which I'm going to talk about in a little bit later. I also, there's no ramp in photo, which is probably good because it's already pretty powerful enough as it is, but I wanted to play around with some idea of ramp, and so I came up with two characters that um, generate resource counters, and one is a supporting character named Michael Gray, and the longer you can keep him out, and um, if you don't spend all of your resource points, then he gains these resource counters, and then you can spend those later, so it kind of fixes the mid-game if you're not getting the high cost or the right cost characters that you want but you keep pulling you know maybe high cost characters then maybe you can spend the resource counters that he gains and like bring out someone bring bring Thanos out early or something like that and likewise Tatiana Petrovna is a main character and her whole deal her whole level up is based on getting resource counters and getting resources out and then once she levels up then she 
can spend those resources on higher cost characters that kind of beat the curve. And the way I tried to design her, hopefully successfully, is that she's kind of high risk, high reward. So if you don't start and if you don't start your hand with a fortress specifically in hand, then you might not win the game. But if you do start on turn one with a fortress in your hand, then there's probably a good chance that you can get some pretty tough characters out pretty quickly. So she's been fun to see um, in playtesting, and and she hasn't appeared to be too overpowered, but um, I imagine she would catch some people's eyes uh, when they see her. Other mechanics that I wanted to include in this game are things that address some of my frustrations in the game. So uh, everyone knows that Outriders are a little overpowered at the moment, so I created a character that uh, specifically was built to address the overpoweredness of Outriders. That was John Shelby. He has the ability to make attacks against multiple characters, uh, assuming he survives the initial combat. And so he could take out um, each one of the Outriders on turn five, I think, for a skill location, um, you know, if he can make it happen. So it's fun to kind of come up with magic bullets to things that annoy me. I think that a lot of the cancellation powers, like you're the last one and he's a friend from work, are good in the photo set, particularly against illustrated cards, because again, um, illustrated has a lot of variety and photo needed the help to be able to survive competitively um, by just basically getting your butt out of combat. But I feel like in the photo universe, um, all the combat cancellation makes for kind of dull games and um, makes for, for short games as well. And so I created some characters like Luca Changretta and Arthur Shelby, who um, have the ability to, to cancel the cancellations. So mechanics like that I feel like are needed for the photo format, and building a set like this kind of lets me live in a fantasy world where there's actually something that I can do about it. And the last thing that I think a card set needs to be actually good is to be good flavor. It's not versus if the flavor isn't there. Um, in any other game, maybe you could get away with having bad flavor, but for it to be versus, you know, you just have to, the, the flavor has to be really spot on. So that to me started with the teams. The Peaky Blinders were the obvious one for the good team because the show is called Peaky Blinders and the gang is called Peaky Blinders. And so of course the good team's gonna be called Peaky Blinders. The evil team was a lot harder to think of um, because it's kind of a mishmash of police officers, rival gangsters, because Beaky Blinders are gangsters too. They're the good gangsters though. We got the evil gangsters. And then just like the women who get in the way of the Shelby's lives and kind of screw things up for them. And so it's like, what do you call that team? You can't call them gangsters because you've got these women in here who are not gangsters. You can't call them the police because you've got the gangsters in there and it would be weird to call gangsters police and so I was like what do you call this team and I think pretty early in the first season Tommy tells his younger brother that there's trouble coming and that kind of like piqued my interest a little bit I was like oh trouble that could be a good name because like the coppers give them trouble the gang the rival gangs give them trouble all these women are giving them trouble and and I, it turns out that as the show goes on, they, they say trouble a lot, and they talk about trouble coming, and and there's going to be trouble, and and you're causing me trouble, and all kinds of stuff. And so I was like, oh, this is perfect. So um, it, was, it was really fun to kind of settle on that, because it, it really sounds like a great name for an evil team. Also, to get the flavor right, you got to pick the right screenshots. Now, uh, <laughs> you could argue that uh, Versus is actually really bad at this. Um, this part of it is choosing particularly photo screenshots that are uh, actually good and representative of the characters. So I actually wanted to outdo the game designers with this one. And, and I know that their hands are tied somewhat. I don't think the game designers actually get to choose much of the art that they're presented with. I think that's someone else's job or someone else's responsibility or someone else has made it their responsibility. So I don't fault them for it, but since I'm, again, doing this completely fantastical set. I was gonna, I was bound and determined to get the best photos of the, um, the different actors and actresses as I could. I just got kind of crazy with it because I watched every single episode 
And anytime I saw something that might be a potentially good angle for someone, then I would pause it and I would take a screenshot and then I would like advance a few frames and I would take another screenshot and then I might advance one more frame and take another screenshot. I have so many screenshots of all these different characters that could have been the cards, but ultimately I had to decide on one or in the case of main characters with supporting characters, three of them. Those were the ones I felt like I had a wealth of riches because I had so many opportunities to choose different screenshots. But ultimately it comes down to making a decision and um, I feel like it was one of the more fun things was figuring out which character or which screenshots best represented the characters in their, in their element, so to speak. That was really fun. The powers, that's another thing where you can generate a lot of flavor. Uh, Super Awesome Games has set a high bar with the quotes that they use for um, plot twists and superpowers and things like that and I, I wanted to follow in those footsteps again and so I was constantly logging different potential quotes for characters that I thought might be might be good to include and, and again I put that in my spreadsheet and I you know throw a quote in there and come up with a power based on it and sometimes it wouldn't feel quite like the character or I'd watch the show some more and, and I'd find another quote that was kind of better for it and so I'd have to rethink the power and think about how they fit into the set and things like that. And it was especially difficult with Grace because when she leveled up, I had a level up power for her, but then she hit a point where she said, I think our time has come to a natural conclusion or something like that. And it just gave me this great idea for a level up power to kind of help her tell her story. And it was basically to wound Chester Campbell and then she levels up because of it. But the problem was that he was too high in the in the cost chart. So he was a six cost, which is like way too late in the game to be leveling up. And I was like, I at least gotta get him down to five. And so then I had to go through and like retool, you know, his powers because I didn't want him to be too overpowered for a five cost. And I had to move someone else and in, into a different position. And so um, that one was kind of fun, but definitely like you you just always, when you're doing it, you just always got to tune your ear to like, what's the good content that you can like pull out and say like, oh, this would make a good power. This represents who this person is or what their story is or what their journey is or things like that. So that's another thing that you should look at when you're trying to incorporate a really good flavor into your card sets. Another thing that will throw a wrench into your plans are the superpower colors. So you want to make sure that the superpowers make sense for the symbols that, that you're using. So this kind of also goes back to balance in a little way. But if you have someone using the green fist for might, then you want to make sure that you're actually doing something with might's power set, so to speak. Like might tends to put lots of big counters on people. So if you think of the card might makes right, you put plus four or four plus one plus one counters on a character or, um, the one that's coming to my head is the seven cost Hulk where you pay a might and then you put seven plus one plus one counters on him. So there's kind of themes that run throughout the game that are already established and ingrained and you want to make sure that those all kind of fit. So that makes it challenging, especially if you're trying to get that balance of two power symbols per team in your set. You want to make sure that you're giving people incentive to use those power symbols and to also have them be balanced across the set in, in that way, which is, Turns out it's, uh, it makes things pretty tricky. I ended up fudging things a little bit with Father John Hughes. He is he has a power which is called Informant, and for an intellect you can put a minus one, minus one counter on a character, and that works with his keyword power as well, which is um, odd fellow, and it, it, he's trying to get the certain right number of odd numbers on a character. And it seems a little expensive to use an intellect power for um, a minus one counter, but the way that I see it is that intellect doesn't typically put minus one counters on, that's typically what energy does. And so basically having the, the yellow power doing a different job makes it kind of extra expensive. Um, I don't know, maybe it doesn't actually work, but that's kind of what I was thinking is like, intellect isn't made for minus one counters and so you only get one when you spend this power because um, if you want lots of minus one counters you should be like building an energy deck instead so it's kind of like going cross power cross color or whatever um, so intellect isn't supposed to do that and so it doesn't do it very well so to speak again maybe it doesn't work but um, that's just some 
you know, it's, there's, there's so many rules in this game. <laughs> it's crazy. And the whole point of flavor is to give the player a good sense of the show. You want the player to feel like they're sort of in the show while they're playing the game. And so that's something that I was thinking about as well. And that's when you want to get characters and screenshots and powers that like make sense for those characters because it's pointless to like put down a card and, and it has someone's face on it and it's like I don't understand like why this person matters to this power set that I'm getting. So you want to make sure that the powers are aligning with the character and that those characters feel like the, the real characters from the show. I mean that's why you're playing the game in the first place is you, you kind of want to relive or recreate or um, live in that world a little bit. But on the opposite side, you also want the game to be good for people who have never seen the show. Um, you want the cards to kind of be intuitive and understandable for someone who is like, I've never seen Peaky Blinders, but I understand like what the, the setting is and who the characters are and how they interact and how they fight with one another and things like that. So that's another thing that, that's a goal that it's not necessarily, you, ha you have to do one, two, three to make that happen, but you just kind of want to keep your eye on, on how that all works. And finally, is it VSE? <laughs> Um, does it feel like it was the cards were written for Versus System or does it feel like they were written for another game? I ran into this a lot having to go back. I have I, I played Magic so long ago but I still found myself writing in Magic syntax so like Magic says target character blah blah blah. They don't they don't use target in Versus System. They use choose a character or choose a supporting character or whatever. So being really deliberate about you know making the cards sound like they were written for the game was something that was kind of important for me so that people didn't feel like they were playing a, a hybrid game or or playing f fake cards in a game that they weren't made for. Even though that's totally what they are, they're totally fake cards, but I didn't want it to feel fake. I wanted it to feel genuine and I wanted it to feel authentic and I wanted it to be I wanted it to feel VSE. That's all. All right, so some final takeaways about this. One, uh, this is not easy. Designing a 200 card set is not an easy task and it's it's sort of a wonder that we get cards as often as we do in Versus System because it just, it takes so much thought and especially having to balance everything out. I mean, you could easily throw out garbage and I don't think that's what we get from the people at Super Awesome Games. I think that we get a lot of really high quality content and I think we have a really fun game and it's just great to get this constant stream of, of cards that are always changing the way that you look at the game. and. It's, it's just, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> it must take them so much time to prep these things, especially doing doing all the research and, and watching shows and things like that. So uh, kudos to, to those guys always and forever. I also think that you're never going to get it right for everybody. I know that there are people who think that every main character needs to be playable. Um, every per main character needs to be com perfectly competitive with every other character. It's just not the reality. If this was a closed system and a closed game, then yeah, I think you have a right to demand that every main character be exactly as competitive as other, every other main character. But there are so many cards and it's the game is constantly changing so much that like it's just way too much to ask. And I think that part of the fun of Versus isn't just being competitive and going for the big prizes, which like there aren't that many big prizes anyway. Um, I think it's trying out new things and trying out different game modes by picking characters that like have different ways of playing with them and trying to make them work. I don't know, one of my favorite things is just to take a trash character and build a deck around it and just see like what I can do with it. I feel like that might even make me better at playing the good characters because it kind of makes you think about the cards in a different way. So I don't think that um, every card needs to be competitive, but I do think that sh they should be fun and I think that they should have a place somewhere in the game. I try to make every character playable to somebody, I'll put it that way. Another thing is that errors are oftentimes very hard to spot. I think a lot of us had a, a little chuckle at the Mysterio debacle when the Spider-Man Far From Home set came out, but trying to keep track of all the different rules that I've dreamed up and 
there's rules on the card that get mismatched from rules on the spreadsheet and those get mismatched from rules on the rules sheet or the wrong card the old cards get put on the rule sheet or I haven't replaced them with the new cards yet or in the playtesting environment I didn't upload the newest versions of the cards and it's just like a lot to keep track of surprisingly a lot to keep track of and uh, the spreadsheet helps but um, it doesn't help when everything starts getting out of date so sometimes it's hard to remember like what your intention was and how it tested and everything like that and so for me errors are much more forgivable in that light um, just because I know I, it's I've been working on this for months and uh, you know still even finding errors that I've forgotten to correct or I, I just recently replaced the word target with choose and it's I, you know like I said I've been working on this for months so it's kind of crazy how how easy it is to make mistakes and, and I think it's totally forgivable and it's super nice when um, they are willing to replace those mistakes for free so uh, just keep that in mind. Also uh, in my recent rounds of playtesting with my friends I realized that Arthur wasn't quite competitive enough and I wanted him to be a little bit better because I feel like Tommy being the main character is already a pretty tricky character and so having Tommy and Arthur both be challenging characters to win with and to level up with felt like a little bit too unforgivable considering their popularity with the fans. And so I wanted at least one of them to be a little bit more pushed in a more competitive direction and Arthur I've been working with for a long time and he's been very tough to get right and even now I haven't playtested the most recent version which has undergone some pretty significant changes. Um, but I'm pretty much at a point where I'm like, okay, this is done. It's got to get out the door, so to speak. I just got to move on to a new project. And so, again, like, it's, it's, it just takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time to play test these things. It, it takes a lot to get them balanced. I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. And so at some point, you just got to sign off on it and say, you know, if it starts over dominating in tournaments again fantasy set but uh, if you're thinking about the actual cards if they start dominating in tournaments then you got to come up with things in, in the future card sets so it's not the end of the world if something gets a little bit overpowered I think that we're always striving for the right kind of balance in these sets so I think I've talked enough about designing this set. Uh, these are a lot of the things I've learned. I'm sure I'm forgetting some other things that, that I've uh, put a lot of attention into, but um, as you can see, it takes a lot of time and effort, but it's really fun. And if you have a show that you are into and you want to get people interested in it, then I think that uh, doing a versus set is a, is a pretty good way to do it. And then you also get to play in that world a little bit. A few people have seen these cards and they haven't, watch the show at all and they've read through them and they're like oh that's really cool I'm gonna go check that out and so um, I feel like it's a win-win for everyone as long as you don't feel like you're wasting time um, I really enjoy exercises like these I really recommend going and doing it so thanks for watching and I'll see you around next time bye there's just one thing that I want to point out because um, I feel like I'm oh so clever for doing it and uh, no one has noticed it so far and I just can't hold it in any longer. But on Tommy's level two power red right hand, first off the, the theme song for the Peaky Blinders, that's like a big lyric is his red right hand. And that's why that power is on there. But I also chose the power symbols. One, they were conveniently appropriate. Um, but two, one is red and then the other one is the hand. And so I was like, oh, it's, I've got to, I've got to make this work somehow, and and I feel like I did. But the other thing that that I, I can't keep it to keep to myself any longer is that I had to flip the hand, because the fist for might is actually a left hand, and so on the card I actually flipped it so that it's a right hand. So uh, that's just me being clever.